Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT races to discuss their lives, their journeys, their ambitions and their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. I'm Chris Pritchard and with me, as ever, Steve Plater. Steve, how are we doing? Pretty good, Chris, thanks. Good to be back. You were, you arrived here on a, on a motorbike, didn't you? Yeah, the sun's out. So, uh, Is it a comeback? Or bright-eyed, what? bushy-tailed, actually, no. Oh, okay. No, it will not be. And I wasn't particularly fast riding here this morning. Sticking to the speed limits. Of course, sir. Of course you were. Let's get on with this guest. Jamie Coward, by far the top privateer uh, at the past couple of TTs. Um, what's your opinion on him? Where do you think he's going to go? Good lad. You know, obviously a fast lad. Very, very, very nearly a TT winner in 2019. And I'm sure he's with a new team. And I'm sure he's going to be busting to go one better. Let's talk to him now. Our guest for today's episode of the TT Podcast is Jamie Coward. Since making his TT debut back in 2013, he's gradually risen through the ranks of the TT paddock to become a regular top 10 contender. But unlike most of our other podcast guests so far, it's not been done with the support of big teams or as a professional racer. It's been done whilst holding down a full-time job and going racing on the weekends as the ultimate privateer racer. Now a podium finisher and a member of the illustrious 130 mile an hour club, can he make the next step up and become one of the TT's biggest stars? Let's find out, Steve, as we introduce and welcome Jamie Coward. Jamie, how are you? I'm fantastic, Tom. How are you? I'm all, yep, first time somebody's asked me that on, uh, this, on this podcast. Thanks, mate. I'm really well. Been Yorkshire. Nice, I always ask you, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> that's the Yorkshire in him, though. That's, that's what, that's true, what I thought very that's what true. Did, true gentleman. Yeah, I'm great, thank you. Nice. How are you, Steve? Tip top, thanks. Yeah, nice little ride over on the, on the bike this morning. Yeah. Nice bit of sunshine, so happy as Larry. Good. Let's get into this, Jamie. First question we always ask every guest, and obviously you've listened to a few of these podcasts, so you already know this question's yeah. coming. We're lining up on the on the start line. We roll through, getting that tap on that shoulder. Let's take a big deep breath and thinking about it. <laughs> I think most people do when they do. <laughs> yeah, they as soon do, as you yeah. as soon as you get it in your head, you you know you start to feel it. Yeah. What is going through your mind at that moment? Uh, it's it's, it's uh, difficult really. Obviously, you're very very nervous. I am I'm really really nervous. And, and as Steve knows, as soon as you set off down the hill, that them nerves go. But you just concentrate on your job, uh, thanking your team shaking their hands and just making sure everything's all right and just keeping yourself up to it's it's difficult one it's just getting yourself used to uh the, the surroundings and the people and stuff and you just get yourself psyched up ready to go has it changed throughout the years you've been there yeah initially when i first went uh it were weren't as nervous because you didn't really uh expect to achieve anything but it's as, just, as you've gone on in time and have progressed i've it's you get into like i said podium finishes now and then the top five, top ten finishes, and 130 mile hour and stuff. So it's you've got a bit of a like weight on your shoulders and expectations, I suppose. But it, it gets a bit more uh, difficult as you get further up the ranks. Before we go back in time and we, you know, discuss how you've managed to get to where you've got to, um, I've totally forgot what I was going to say. Can you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say was, how does the pressure change between you go there and you don't really know the course as a as a as a newcomer? How does the pressure change from that to now being a contender for the podium? Is there more pressure or less pressure? There's less less pressure when you first initially go. Like, so I, I worked at the Manx and I first ever went, so you just literally go in there for bike time and ride around and just learn the circuit. So it's there's no pressure at all from anybody. You're just going with there with your family, and now obviously we are in a team and they've got team sponsors and blur things to look at or people to uh, what's the word? It's people to uh, I cannot not what's the word. Uh, don't ask us. I don't. I don't even know myself. <laughs> but you've got people. You've got people not to impress, but you've got people to. Obviously, people are putting money into the team, so you've got to try and get good results. Them and mm-hmm. publi- publish or publi- uh, publicize. That's one. Publicize them. You know. So it's uh, it's, yeah, it's that's when you get to that sort of stage where that's where the pressure comes from. You know, it's uh, not so much from the team, but it's just in, just it's impressing people and publicizing the team sponsors and just getting making the, the, them their presence kind of thing felt felt. Just on that last question, you know, from Chris about coming to the TT, obviously, for the first time. Do you think it really helps going to the Manx first? Obviously, you were competitive at the Manx, but because you're probably not, as a newcomer at the TT, going to be as competitive with the, with the top boys, yeah, yeah. does that make it a little bit easier for you? Uh, I, I found, 
I I got told to go that way just because I didn't get told, but I got I uh, my dad he went there, so I was going. It was cheaper, for, obviously, for us to go there, and me jump in the van with my dad with my bike instead of having to go myself. So, but it's uh yeah, I think I think the pressure there's not as much pressure at the Manx. You know, you just get to go there, get an holiday, and enjoy yourself, ride around. Whereas the TT, if you need to make a mark, you, when you go as a newcomer, you kind of feel pressure to to try and get that newcomer's record or new not record but newcomer's prize or be the best newcomer there you know so whereas in the Manx there's not there's not as much pressure you just go there as a bit of an holiday ride around and then just enjoy yourself just just on that you know on, on your father um i know very little about him really just tell us a little bit about his background and what got you into racing yeah him um, dad's paul uh, paul coward he, he, he raced in ireland quite a lot did uh, he were 350 uh irish road race championship or won that and he actually was the best newcomer, I think it was 1999, TT, on a 750 Kawasaki. And then he uh, did the Ulster Grand Prix, he did all the big road races, but he never took it. His, uh, I think he, he got he got started later in his, in his in his career, so he never really got took under someone's wing or into a team or anything. So he was just doing it all himself, but he just enjoyed going on himself and just riding his bikes and stuff. But he did, he had some good achievements and accomplishments, you know, so... And uh, I just I just remember going. Uh, I remember the first ever experience or memory from actually going with my dad was I think it was in like the nineteen ninety six Scarborough uh, Gold Cup event. There were a massive massive amount of crowd there, and they were like Agostini, Joy Dunlop were there, and I were only six at the time. And my idol and my, my heroes, uh, Joy Dunlop, had just been there watching him. And, and uh, I remember going to get a photo of him. I still got the photo on out to this day. And uh, Lee with a little blonde hair and sun next to Joy like that. And uh, <laughs> It's just, but that that's the first ever memory I got from going with my dad. You know, it's just just them sort of experiences you don't get. You know, I just I, it's just from that I just I just wanted to be watching Joey and my dad and other people, and I just wanted to be a racer. You know, until until I got myself a job, I couldn't really do that. But yeah, it's uh, I, I'm I'll, I love it. I absolutely love it. So you so you didn't go the route of schoolboy motocross starting when you were six seven years old. It, it came much later to you. Yeah, same as same not as obviously late as my dad, but I went. I dad, mum, my mum and dad couldn't afford to. Uh, or they didn't want to get myself into debt and do that, blah, blah, blah. So as soon as I got myself a job, my first week's wage went into my first entry for a race meeting and we went racing. So when I was 17, I got my first week's wage and then went straight into an event and we went racing. So and my, my dad, me and my dad built the bike in the uh, in the shed at the back of the house out of parts that my dad spare parts and dad had from racing. So we uh, it was spiraled out of control from there. So we didn't. So the the race bike didn't cost you anything. No, no, we just place. we just spares that my dad had kicking about some just wheels, together and, and went forks, racing. and yeah, we just threw it together with my dad's spare engine that he used to have, and then I went racing. How was your first race? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> our our uh, I tell you what, I you know, a little track called Tom for now. In yeah. the Wales, oh, Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of it. Never, I went, never I went down there kicking sheep shit off a uh, track <laughs> before I went out for practice. <laughs> but yeah, um, um, and my dad were in the race. Me and my dad went obviously in the van, blah blah, with my mum and sister. And I, I actually qualified not too bad. I think I was like second, or third row. So I could see my dad, and I thought, oh, I set off and I was chasing my dad. I think, Jesus, I'm doing well here because obviously I looked up to my dad. And my dad was really good at the time, and he still probably will still is good. But I was chasing him, chasing him, went into, uh, did completed one lap, went into this like tight right hander on the circuit. It all, it's, there's no left handers, it's all right. Went into this tight left right, right hander on the brakes, broke, break, I oh, oh, break at the same time as my dad. Broke at the same time as my dad, and I ended up on my ass, and dad ended up trying, carrying, carrying on a winning race. <laughs> so I ended up crashing my first race. So that was an experience. But yeah, it were, uh, it's uh, f- from that, like I said, it's all just spiral out of control. So previous to that, what kind of experience did you have on a bike? I used Anything to have a, a TY8 to Yamaha. Right. I used to ride around on that, and then not far from mum and dad's house is a bit of a like a bit of an industrial estate, not massive but fairly big. And on a Saturday and a Sunday, we used to go down the gates. We used to be left open, and my dad used to have a bit of chalk. And I had like a little Rev and Go 50cc thing, mm. like a like a like a mini moto. And my dad used to ride around, and make a track out of chalk, and I used to go scratching with my dad and down at car park, and then that's that's it. Just started from that's there, started. really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mega. Wow. So let's talk, well, let's get on to TT. Obviously, like Steve said earlier, you started at the Manx. How was that experience for you? Uh, like, like I said before, it were uh, something I've always wanted to do. That's what Joy Dunlop did and my dad did and all the people that I look up who t- kind of did. So my first experience for that were finishing the race and just the first lap were just absolutely surreal. It were, 
put it all in perspective, you go for a newcomer's lap and you follow someone like Steve round an ex-rider or whatever, and it's got experience, you follow them round for a lap and you come back in and you get the up to your start, up to the thing and you get your tap on the shoulder and you set off down and it's like fucking <laughs> hyperspace, you know, for after you follow this marshal round, you set <laughs> off and you're always like, ah, <laughs> it's just absolutely surreal. But yeah, that, uh, from then obviously you kind of calm yourself down after that first night and I, I just went there, like I said, it went all the way for my mum, me and my mum and dad and my sister and we used to, that's what we used to take as we used to go race on a night time. We used to have it back in all the during the day. We used to go to the zoo, go to the beach, go for an ice cream, and then we used to go racing on a night time. So I actually did all right, to be fair, my first time there. I think I was fourth in a newcomer's race or whatever. On a, I actually was going to go on a classic bike initially, but one of the local lads from us had a, an R6 that I uh, I borrowed and uh, I used that. So yeah, it were. Uh, yeah, it were, it, like I said, it was just like hyperspace after that first couple of laps, but then it's, it, I just I just really, really enjoyed it. It was crazy. That, you know, the first lap behind the Travelling Marshalls are fast lap. It's under, yeah, yeah, under it's not, by not, like that not, normally yeah, anyway. Not, then they're not slow, but when you go out on your own, it's just like completely, it's just an, <laughs> another worldly experience, isn't it? You obviously know yourself, but yeah, it was uh, some experience, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's from that that I just took me the love for the mountain course and uh, I just, like I said, I just love it. You know, you see, obviously for this year, for 2022 at the TT, is a big name, um, you know, Glenn Irwin's going over. And he's been very loud and noisy saying not what he's going to do, that he's going to kind of be relaxed. However, he's been over there and probably done 70 or 80 laps. You know, was that the kind of way you approached it? I didn't actually, because like I said, my dad used to race there. So I used to go with my dad and my dad used to go do laps in the vans with different people and blah, blah, blah. Not He was learning the circuit himself kind of thing. So I used to jump in a van and we must have done, like I said, when we were there for two weeks, when we were at the Manx Grand Prix, we, I used to ride around in the van with my dad and must have done 67 laps like on, on the first time we were there. So I kind of got my experience from what, listening to people, older races, for example, a, a guy called Les Trotter that won the Manx Grand Prix a few years ago, or I can't remember what the date was, but I used to go out with him and he used to give ex, uh, his uh, expertise or what lines and stuff like that. Then you got a, play, a guy called Watty Brown that, that used to go, I used to follow, dad used to go around with him and, there's loads of different people. I used to go, we used to do laps and laps and laps and laps, you know, so I haven't been over for this. Also, we had a two-year break now, so I haven't been over yet, but I'm hoping to plan to go over and uh, have a bit of a look myself, you know, or soon, but, uh, yeah, it's just from the experience of being young and actually being there with my dad and just taking it all in when I was there. So was there never any doubt that you would go into the TT? Obviously, like you said, seeing your dad, there was no thoughts of going short-circuit racing? Uh, no, I always... I always like I said, my dad used to road race, my hero with Joy Dunlop, my idol, and I wanted to do what they wanted to do kind of thing when I was younger. So as soon as I got my national licence and I could go do the Manx Grand Prix, that's what I wanted to go do. And then the pre-TT, this is on the Southern 100 circuit, and then yeah. the North West and the Ulster Grand Prix and stuff. So it's just what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to uh, wanted to be. I wanted to be a road racer. And I never fancied doing the short circuits. I don't go too bad at the short circuits. So just, I always wanted to be a road racer. And how about now? Obviously, we've seen the lights of Hickey coming through. Like Steve just said, Glenn Irwin's coming kind across. Of, yeah, but that sort of question, I kind of look back now and I wish I had probably had done a bit more short yeah. circuit racing prior to going to the roads because I think that helps, you know, and the guys now like Peter and Dean and the top boys, not including on the top boys, they go do a lot of short circuit racing now before they go to the TT. So I think it's something that you need to do to be at the top and as, as good as them kind of thing. So the new team that I'm riding for, hopefully we can get a bit more a bit more time on the bikes before we go and then we can, hopefully we can... Uh, we can go and do that, do that as well. Do a few BSB super stock rounds or super stock rounds, something like that. So we'll just have to wait and see. So let's talk about teams then. Obviously, like I said in the introduction, you're the classic privateer. Yeah, you're yeah. doing it your way, and and it it really is. And I've I've met you a couple of times, and when I've been over across the TT, I've seen it for myself. It's a family affair. Yeah, everyone's yeah. involved. Yeah, my mom, so everyone everyone comes with me. So tell me about that. What's it like having everybody there? What's it like having this this family unit as a team? can be a bit frustrating at certain times. With a five hey, mate, a listen, I'm with you there. I'm not, I, I, obviously, I know your mother. Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm Steve, with you 100%. Steve, Steve Flipping, eh? Well, that's just aggro, isn't it? Proper <laughs> aggro. It is, to be fair, yeah. No, I've got... <laughs> I, I said, my mum, mum's obviously a pain in the ass, like Steve just mentioned. I've got two uh, young kids now as well, so they just run around pulling my hair out and pulling limbs off me every time they can get hold of me. And then, uh, obviously, I've got we've got a big entourage that come in, like my mum and my sister, and that's the, my girlfriend, girlfriend's mum and dad, they come in, the two kids, so it's... Like I said, it's just it's just like it used to be when I used to go with my dad and my mum. It's just a big family affair, you know. So we just they enjoy coming across and watching and 
I don't get any aggro from about doing the roads either because a lot of people probably do, you know. So it's, I hope, but yeah, it's uh, just a big family affair. And uh, the teams that I've been riding for, they like that as well, you know. Just come up to have a bit of a laugh and hopefully get some decent results on the way. So just rewind a little bit from what Chris said with uh, the tap on the shoulder when you when you move forward and go through that arch and or line up to the arch in no man's land, let's say. Is it a breath of fresh air for you, getting rid of your mother and the missus <laughs> yeah. and the kids and everything yeah, else? Or, or is it difficult to... I'm, no, I'm being serious. No, or is I'm it difficult to races. leave them, switch I off wish, and I move on the to... I wish races were longer, to be fair, but I think I'd see them all. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're talking my <laughs> language. <laughs> no, no, it's... Uh, it, like I said, it, as soon as you get that... As soon as you sit on the bike and you get through that archway and you get a tap, it's just like I said, it's just a breath of fresh air, you know, to get away and then for my kids and stuff. But it's just, just to tackle the mountain course. I love the tackling the mountain course, you know. I don't think it's been released yet, but for this season, for this year, I'm going number one on the Super Twin. And I just that is the the pinnacle of the mountain course and the TT races to go on the road and race yourself against the time against the clock. And I can't wait to do that. It's just some it's a a, a builder, ground worker, digger driver from Ebden Bridge, Yorkshire, West Yorkshire. You can't say there's not many people said that they're going off at number one at the TT or and from that sort of background. So and I just I've, I'm just fully that's just a, a be all and end all, you know. Did you push for number one? Is that yeah, I did, something yeah, yeah. you wanted in that class? Yeah, I wanted number one in the class just from just from previous uh, previous results. You know, the last time there, 2019, I, every time I went out to practice on the Super Twin on any bike, I used to go on my own and just do my own thing. And I, my times are the fastest I've ever been down there before. Then in 2017, I think it was or 18, I did. Uh, a Manx Norton, the first ever person to do 110 mile an hour lap on a single cylinder 500. And that was, I was set off number three, but two and one broke down. So for four laps, I was on my Todd. So the option came up with number one. And then uh, I wanted number one or number seven, because seven's obviously obvious reasons, because he's behind Michael. And if you can see Michael, you can catch him. But number one, I just, it's a pinnacle of the Alaman TT races. And to get that op or the opportunity to be number one, it's just, uh, I can't wait. It's going to be unbelievable. You're not worried about, obviously, you, know, you listen to uh, Hickey or John McGuinness, you know, the, some, some of the big winners on the superbikes, and they're not so keen on clearing the, clearing the course and getting rid of all the birds, and, you know, no. that that's what they complain of, but it's yeah. just, you're not worried about that at all. No, no, just like I said, it's it's just just the opportunity to be number one and to actually race the mountain course as it should be raced against the time on your own against just yourself unless someone catches you up hopefully they don't catch up because you know you're doing a shit job then but if, if you're number, <laughs> number one you go off on your own and you're racing the clock you're racing the course you're racing the mountain you know it's just that's what it's the, that is just the, the be all and end all for me you know I know you're very confident you know in that class anyway and, and very very nearly a winner yeah, yeah you must be confident for this year uh, yeah fingers crossed the boys like I said the KHS Racing Power by Stead Plan team have worked so hard on the bike over winter to get a bit more power out and a bit more uh, a bit more performance as you say but yeah I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to going back and tackling it I remember you know I interviewed you at the uh, National Motorcycle Museum and you was whinging and whining and you got held up on that uh, in that race as well by some flipping wally in front of you <laughs> and I, I had a bad I had a I had, did have a bad start not a bad start but I was obviously seeded but I was 15 and in the practice we were one in every practice session I think or the fastest person and obviously because you see you don't get moved up so I set off and it were uh, I got passing people, passing people, and I got up to it was number obviously ten, number Peter, or Peter Ritman, and I got <laughs> I asked, this sounds really bad because obviously Peter's the fastest man ever around there, <laughs> but I actually got held up by by him for like maybe four or five miles, which lost me that three or four seconds. That Did I you lost tell him? My, I never told him. I told him that no, but I will tell him eventually. <laughs> I think he listens to this podcast. Yeah, he? he probably oh, will. Yeah. yeah, but no, I, I don't. I don't get held up by him. But if you, you, you're trying to get past somebody, it's just it was just really difficult. Peter, were, to be fair to him. I were probably a bit more cautious in the corners where Peter was really, really pushing on. So what I made up on the straights, he might make back up in the corners, you know. Like, I think I caught him going into Ren Cullen over the jump and it goes right, left, right, left, right, left. I waited by laughing through there. We were just absolutely on the pipe, like, as you know. And I just, I just couldn't get past, but I managed to squeeze past him eventually. But I think that's what cost me the race, you know. But you were, it's just one of them things at the end of the day. Can't, it can't be helped. It's a mountain course and it's just what happens sometimes. Yeah, exactly. But you're not worried, of course, you know, being labelled really as one of the fastest guys in that class as having a massive target on your back being number one. Yeah, but end of day, if, 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 if I'm number one, it, it could have had, it could, I could have been number seven, number six, number three, number two. It's still got that label on my back. So just to be able to go out there and do it on my own and just set off, like I said just it's being number one on the at the TT and just it's just like I said before, it's just it's just the pinnacle of the sport, racing the time and racing the course. You know, I can't, I just can't wait. So I, I see you as a as a big bike rider. Um, has your focus changed more to 
to the Super Twin now, knowing that you are capable of taking that victory there? Uh, not necessarily, no, no. In 2019, we I did I think I only did two laps on the bike or three laps maybe on the right. bike, and then we parked it up because we knew the pace were there. So I'd, I'd like to class myself as a big bike rider, a 600 rider, and a big twin rider. You know, mm. it's, it's not many people can say they've can ride all three you know but uh the, the super twin like i said steve probably knows as well sometimes the little bikes i might not even ride the little bike i might ride it two 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 laps in practice and leave it and then just wait till the race and then just what happens happens kind of thing but yeah you kind of tend to concentrate on the big bike and i want to try and better myself there as well you know the aim is when i go back there is to go as fast as I, or if i can go faster than i was last time over there then I know i've improved you know i don't really look at results i say if i go 131 then i know i've done a better job than i did last time i came you know so that's my aim every time i go back do you do you suffer more jumping from the little bike to the big bike or from the big bike to the little bike? Uh, probably from the big big bike to the little bike because they don't feel like they're going anywhere. You know, you have that experience. You know, you get off the big bike and you're doing like 200 a mile an hour or whatever, and you get on a 600 and you start there and it's like, is, it, is this thing broken? Is it? It's not. It doesn't feel like it's moving very fast. Is it fast really like that on a, even on a 600? Yeah, it's it's, some, it's surreal. Is like it? it's mental. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah. I think like I said, if you if you jump from the little, I tend to go. We go off the first night of practice. I'll go on the big bike just to frighten myself to death, <laughs> and then then jump off onto the small stuff because then it, everything it just, else is yeah, slower. That, yeah, yeah, it just it just helps, you know. So yeah, it's uh, I kind of feel, I feel that the jumping from the big bike, the the big bike to the small bikes is it's easier. But the, from the other way around, I, I never I've never done that, you know. It's just one of them things. How hard do you find it to get your head up to speed at the beginning of practice week? Uh, this is some I get asked quite regularly because I don't. I go the, the reason why, sorry, the reason why I ask that is because obviously you've got Hickey Harrison, as Chris mentioned, doing BSB and yeah, yeah. kind of buzzing. Around. I know the North S two hundred is before the TT, yeah. but it's still you can't beat mileage. No, no, no. I always, I always uh, do the pre TT races before the, which is the weekend before the, or not the weekend. It's actually in the the week of the, the TT because that's where I came from, a background classic bike race, and I get, I'm luckily I get to ride some nice bikes with Ted Wolf on the Norton and the 350 K four. And I go down there, so I kind of think when you go up to that Saturday night uh, and you, you sit off down, or you sit, you sit on the start line, you, you brought my brains already up to speed because mm. I've been down there. Even though the classic bikes and people don't think they go as fast, they are shifting like so. Yeah. I kind of my brains already up to speed, so it's one less thing that I've got to worry about, kind of thing. If, when you when you sit on that start line, you know your brains up to speed. You just got to uh, you just got to tackle the mountain course at the end of the day. That's it. <laughs> so let's go back. <clears throat> excuse me, back in time to your TT uh, a year beyond your TT debut, so 2014. You weren't at the TT? No. Because? I had a massive crash at Tango D. Ha, what happened? Monumental crash at Was Tango it? D. Yeah, massive. I, uh, it, were, uh, it were late on the practice. on uh, In Ireland, they do the Friday practice and they have a race, a couple of races on the Friday night, then the Saturday race and all day kind of thing. And then we practiced on the Friday and they had a race on the Friday night. But it got a bit, it got a bit dark, really, but... The, the, the organisers went ahead with the race because they asked riders if it was safe to do so. I'm not blaming that, but I had a, I had a dark visor on because in some of the sections, the sun were in your face, so you couldn't see, but in the, the back, when you're going away from the sun, you had a dark visor on. It was obviously not pitch black, but dark. Yeah. So I came into it with a section and just tipped in a bit soon and clipped the grass banking and just absolutely catapulted myself into space and then landed and I broke my leg about 10 places and I dislocated me... Uh, my elbow and took all the ligaments off my elbow so I can't I can't straighten this left arm because right. my ligaments have to be drilled into my arm to, to make sure they work obviously again but yeah I had a monumental crash in 2014 and I had to I took the decision then because I was still only young and so uh, coming through kind of thing I just thought to myself oh, you just need to sit this season out I know a lot of people try and rush back but mm -hmm. I took the year out and just got myself right and, and 2015 obviously I came back yeah so I'll the reason I ask that is, is we go back to that that whole family affair of uh, of everyone going to the TT. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, how does that affect the rest of your family? Was there any point you were like, all right, I will will knock this on the head uh, because you'd only just kind of started. Yeah, no, I'd I've only, I'd only just got with my last then Sophie as well, so she was a bit that frightened to bugger as well. To be was fair, was she into bikes or no? She didn't like bikes oh, at right. all. Dad's into <laughs> golf, so. <laughs> Bikes and golf don't go, do they? Not really. You'll probably know that. If you'd ride an enduro bikes in a golf course, you'd th you tend to get balls whacked at you. So, it's, uh, yeah, so he likes it now, don't get me wrong, she loves it now. But uh, initially, when I had this big crash, she was obviously mortified and blah, blah, blah. But we, uh, she obviously knows the risks we take or I take, and everyone takes really in the paddock at races, the bikes at the TT and then on the road. So, 
unfortunately it's just one of them things at the end of the day it's just it has to, it just comes with the nature of the the the, uh, the sport and it's not like you've sorry steve it's not like you've not crashed at the tt either no i've crashed uh, a few a few times i've got an affinity with uh, laurel bank for some reason i seem to fall off there quite often and i actually <laughs> Uh, is there a good pub there or something? No, no, there's no pubs there either. <laughs> it's just shut down. One, it's just a bit too far away as well. No, it's. Uh, I had a couple of crashes there at the Manx, and unfortunately, that's probably one of the reasons why I lost the Manx. You know, because I fell off there, knocked myself unconscious, and obviously you can't ride for four or five days. You know, so it's. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's I've only fallen off twice there, but I don't want to fall off again. And does Sophie put you under any pressure at all to knock it on the head? No, no, she never. never. She never said anything to me. No, so like I said, I'm lucky in that aspect. You know, she. I think it might have been a bit different if I'd been with her before and then started racing, you know. But because I've been racing, she's kind of come into my life and and I've kind of brought along in on the in the journey. And she's she's never said anything about you need to stop that because it's dangerous. She just lets me get on with it, which is uh, I'm lucky in some respects. Because obviously, some a lot of riders and partners don't get on, uh, they don't appreciate or they don't like uh, the whole road racing thing, blah blah blah, and it's a bit shit. But yeah, I'm lucky in that respect. So then fast forward beyond that, you get yourself repaired, you get yourself back up to fitness. 2017 and 18, kind of breakthrough years for you where, yeah, you, yeah. where you claimed your first top 10. Yeah, yeah, Did yeah. you feel like you'd started to make progression, you got used to the course and you were you were ready to kind of tackle it and take on the uh, the top boys at the yeah, TT? Yeah, that's when it's uh, 2000, I think 2015 or 16, maybe, I think, or 17. I was still running my, or 16, I think it was. I was still running my own team. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a Fireblade, a Kawasaki 600 and uh, a little Super Twin then. And we were fighting for, I don't know how, we were fighting for the Privateer Championship. And uh, I, I ended up losing out uh, just to Dan Hegarty then. And mm-hmm. uh, I kind of, from then it kind of thought, well, like, I, I feel like I can actually have a decent go at this kind of thing now. And then luckily I got signed up for a team and they had some better bikes and with better bikes, it becomes more pace and it'd be better better mechanics and stuff like that. And then you're not having, you don't have the pressure sorting the bikes out like yourself, going for t- to get your tyres and picking up your fuel you just get to concentrate on the job kind of thing so it's from from then when you kind of can concentrate on yourself and do a lot more fitness and blah 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 where you, you kind of improve you know i bet you're at a loose end then going from doing everything to yeah, then people yeah, doing it around you, 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 it must be. you kind of are but at the end of the day like i said to be where mm-hmm. i am now you need kind of need that mentality where you can the lads that i'm out working for they you trust them they work on your bike and they change make the changes then you can go off and you can do your own thing kind of thing and just forget about it you know and like I said, for the TT, I said I got my family there. So during the day, we might, I, I can't, we, st- we stop in a house and I can't do with getting up in the morning. And for two weeks, you can't, I can't go to bed looking at a bike and then wake up in the morning looking mm-hmm. at a bike. So I think to get away from it and have a bit of a break, it's, it helps, you know. So we go with the kids to the zoo or we go maybe to the car for man for something to, for a bit of breakfast or whatever and just kind of forget about the event until a bit like, that mid afternoon, then we think, right, shit, I've got to put my levers back on again now yeah. and go racing around, but not shit. But I think, yeah, I need to get ready now and get myself psyched up. From what you said earlier, I thought he was going to say you'd take the kids back to the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish I could leave them there. <laughs> but... <laughs> with, with that, you know, with. My mum, I'd leave my mum at the zoo as well. <laughs> <laughs> during you know uh, during the off season you, you'll you obviously have your Peter Hickmans your Dean Harrisons and they'll be negotiating their deals for the following year um, you know to do obviously the, the, the international roads of TT and, and the other events as well but also they'll be desperate to be pushing to do short circuit BSB and so on so for you with with your with your teams you know over the last few years private tier teams because you're always they're always very very well turned out and look the part yeah, yeah. you know what's your what do you sit down and say to them that you want to do for the following year? Well, it's difficult because, like I said, I've, I've I've just joined this team, the KTS Racing Power by Step Plan team for this season, and they've had to they spent like most of this year building bikes. So we've only just recently just been out on the bikes at short circuit level just to do any racing. So I've never had that like consistency of being in the same team. I've uh, jumped from uh, seventeen, I were uh, for riding for a team called Rackless Racing, and then eighteen I rode for Pens Thirteen. 19 I rode for Prez Racing and now I'm with this you know, this team now so it's I'm hoping now we're, I'm in a team that we, we really gel we get on really well the whole team and we've got a lot of good sponsors on board and stuff and I'm hoping maybe after this season into next season we can look at doing some like I said BSB Superstock or Supersport just to unfortunately we might not get there this year before the TT because it's it's just so tight on time with bike builds and blah blah blah. But hopefully now we've got the, the foundations there, we can maybe for maybe two or three years work on something and go do some short circuits and stuff. So 
they can kind of know what what they want to do and what I want to do. So we we kind of work under the same like hymn sheet kind of thing. So it's a uh, hopefully like I said after we get the, we get this season out there we can look and plan to do a bit more like I said with like the Peter and Dean do a short circuit. So we'll try and do that. I think. Just tell us a little bit. You know. Um, give us a sales pitch. Tell us a little bit about their background, the team, and who they are and what they do and where they're from. Yeah, it's a, a team called they're called KTS Racing Powered by Steadplant. Uh, is a, a lad called Stanley Stewart who uh, he's thrown a bike into the mix as well in R6. But the Kevin and Simon actually uh, sponsored Dan Cooper, and Dan Cooper rode their Super Twins for maybe six or seven years, and then I think it was nineteen they decided uh, to ride a, run a second rider, uh, which was me luckily enough, and then. At the northwest, we had Glen Irwin and myself and Dan at the TT and blah blah blah. So they've been around the paddock a long time. Kevin's obviously uh, he's the owner of the team. Uh, uh, this is a guy called Simon Bleasdale, who's uh, he's an ex crew chief at uh, MotoGP level. Uh, we've got uh, I said Kevin and Simon. We've got Jim, who's the step plan owner of the step plan sales to, uh, company. He's thrown a big lump in to help out with the team and contribute towards. So. We've got a good, like I said, we've got a good set of lads and they've been around a long time, even though they've been under Dan, Dan Cooper Motorsport for a long time. Now they've, they've kind of stuck a big step up and luckily put the faith in me to run uh, run, run myself on their bikes and they've built, like I said, they've built me an R1. Stanley's uh, provided his R6 to the team, which the team are working on and getting ready for the uh, TT in the Northwest. And obviously we've got the big the, the, the Super Twin as well, you know, so it's a big, uh, like I said, it's a big icon with my family and with the team itself, it's like a big family affair with them, you know, we had a good laugh and crack a few jokes and take piss out of each other, you know, it's just how it should be, you know, that's what I enjoy about with, with the team, it's, it's it's mint. So it's a, it's a professional team, no <laughs> doubt, but it's not as, you know, it's not as big as, as the likes of, the, no, you no, know, no, the no. factory Honda team. Um, do you feel like you're at a disadvantage? Because it's slightly different, or at least it feels from looking in, that you don't need to be on the factory bike to win at a TT, do you? F- but do you feel like you're at a disadvantage because you're not getting paid like the other riders, or do you feel with the right bike, the I right f- situation, you can? I, f- I find it. It's the only thing I find really difficult about it is that is when you like I said you go from the northwest and to the TT. For example, myself, I've I finished work on on the Friday before the northwest. On the Friday night, I drive up to Simon's or Kevin's, and we go across the northwest, mm-hmm. do the northwest. On the on the Sunday or the Monday or after the Saturday race in the North Face, I go back to work. You know, whereas the people I'm actually competing with now, they get to go and I don't know what they do. They just, I don't. They, they don't have to go to work. They, they've yeah. got. They just go and concentrate on getting themselves ready and fit, kind of thing, ready for the, the TT. Whereas I've got to go. Not just me. There's obviously other riders that, that do the same thing. But I find it difficult jumping. Uh, going for the northwest, then straight back to work, and you just don't get time to recover and get your uh, just come back to like normality. You know, it's just difficult that way. But for the bike, for the bike side of things, it's there's not much difference between a privateer bike nowadays because mm-hmm. the, and the, and the, the big the big super bikes. You know, because there's I think a, a normal super stock bike now is another two hundred like five, you know, ten brake horsepower, and the super bike maybe two hundred and twenty. So there's, there's there's hardly any difference between them. You know, so and you get some advantages on the super stock bike. You get traction control and anti wheeling and all that stuff. For the super bike, you don't. So it's there's lots of negatives and positives. But I think with the and then obviously the other things with the, with the factory backing and stuff like that, you've got to keep the the manufacturers happy and blah blah mm-hmm. blah. When you're running your own team, it's kind of what the team guy say goes kind of thing. You know, it's it's, it's sometimes it's easier and sometimes it can be worse. You know. But we are getting a little bit of help from Yamaha this year on the R1 and the R6 or raceways and such. So, yeah. So it's uh, this season. It should be. It should be good. You know. It's. It's. Uh, it, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, you're clearly a northern lad who who obviously works hard. Would you like the opportunity to not have to go back to work on the Monday morning? Yeah, yeah. It's been discussed <laughs> with the team many yeah. times, but it's at the moment because it's been so fresh a new team. It's they don't have that sort of backing and the, the, that, that sort of support. It would be nice to for maybe a couple of seasons just to do it professionally you know getting <clears throat> actually going to and looking after yourself properly you know and being, eating the right foods and being able to diet like a proper dietitian and just mm-hmm. be doing it properly you know it'd be nice to see what i can achieve at that sort of level and not that i'm doing a bad job now you know i'm a, no, 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 no. a ground worker digger driver or whatever and eating bacon and bacon and egg sandwiches on a Monday or Friday morning it's not good is it for you know especially fish and chips on a Friday fast, fish and chip <laughs> Friday you know, he knows the rules but it's uh, it, it, you can't really you can compete with them sort of people that are professional but it's it's difficult because you don't get that sort of uh, relaxation and the rehabilitation you need for, for going from one event to another I want to know how Steve knows about fish and chip Fridays you've hey, never mate. done a day's graft in your life have get you? it out show me your hands 
Look at those <laughs> flipping things. What do you do? Pick flowers with them? <laughs> flipping it, boy. I'll tell you yeah, what, no, I had 10 years on the... And even back through COVID, I was back on the trail. Oh, yeah, you did say that. I'm sorry. Get in. <laughs> Go and wash your mouth out, young man. <laughs> so sh- let's talk 2022 and the future. Obviously, we are only a matter of weeks away now from, from the TT. Are you already signed to think about it now like you said you've not been across there but you're heading over there to, to do some laps yeah i'm hoping uh i'm away this weekend racing on the, the bikes and the, i think there's a weekend break uh, i'm going to try and get over to the island then and do a few laps i think and uh i'll take my car over and just ride around and round and round in circles to get my brain up to speed but like i said before we were discussing before we started doing a podcast i've been doing a lot of swifting and cycling on a night time when i can get time and uh i've got myself a little ipad like steve's got there and i just i put on board videos on of the TT and just try and refresh your brain and talk my way through laps and, and I just try and keep as fresh as you can you know it's just it's the only way I can really do it obviously working and with a bike on the bike blowing out my ringer and then watching the watching the uh watching the on board who's on board do you watch I was just gonna ask that <laughs> sorry Steve I knew you were gonna ask that the best uh, Not Steve Shaw. best one I, I like watching or the one I like watching the most is uh John McGuinness from 2015 I think it's the the senior TT the, senior. the opening lap that one's a fantastic lap is that it's uh to be fair, it's, it's a few. It's hard to say this, but he just make a few mistakes in a few places. And you know, we're watching. It's a couple. He was of, pushing really hard. Pushing there, yeah. really, obviously pushing really hard, but he uh, there's a few downshifts, too many downshifts in a few places, and not enough downshifts in a few places. But don't get me wrong, that's the one of the best laps I've ever seen. So, Steve, you'll be able to answer this as well. When you're watching on board, are you simply just watching it going right? He's now at such and such. He's at Quarry Bridge. He's, he's here. He's there. Or are you going right? I'm in. I'm in second gear here. I'm accelerating through, I'm pushing, I'm letting the bike run out wide, and then there's there's my marker that I'm looking for. How does yeah. it how does it work? Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> yeah, you're looking for the differences in how you would approach that that particular section, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, every section has got a really important point where you need to get the throttle open and, and run. Cause it's all about momentum there, you know. Yeah. Um, so you're looking for the difference between you you and them. Some places you're better, you know, and, but other places you're considerably or can be considerably worse. So and you kind of just take trying notes to from them as well. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Very much, especially if you're on the same machinery. Mm-hmm. Especially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like I said, like Steve said, I just. I can sit there sometimes on a night time and just talk my through. I've got like tipping in points and marker points that I look for on the circuit. So for like three or four laps, I might have, I just, just keep repeating it. And I just, I just talk my way through a lap. So when I go back, I can think when I ride along that straight, you think, right, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that kind of thing, I'm looking for this. And you need to tip in at that bush or you head out towards that lamp post to tip in and blah, blah, blah. It's just, so you just so your brain's kind of ready to go kind of when, we, when we get back there. Do you have any weird markers along the track because obviously there's lamp posts there's there's hedges and bushes but is there any anything strange that you look for ghostly is one for me ghostly is lamp post on the left hand side it's the third i think it's either the second or the third lamp post i need to check there's some like a uh, wooden post on the side of the track where the people lean over the hedge yeah you come into there you can kind of see them lamp posts and i think it's one two three and you tip into ghostly so that's something a bit peculiar you're looking for when i'm riding along you know is that the same have you got any steve i've got I've got a, a full sheet on here of every reference point around the TT. Have you? If you don't, if you write it, you remember it. But are they are they just normal markers? But yeah, to answer your road? question, sorry, Chris. Like a, yeah, to, to answer like, your question, it's no. Judith's Judith's back door or whatever. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Chris. I, tip, I have to tip in here. I have to shut um, up here. No, you know I, it has to be. How do you know it was Judith? Is that... That's why I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> you spent a lot of time on the album. You. you... <laughs> You have to be, it actually obviously has to be something fixed that doesn't yeah, move, yeah, yeah. you know, but pretty much, no, it's something that stands out and is going to be there f- forever, really, yeah. you know, um, so there's nothing abnormal, you know, and obviously uh, it can't be shrubbery or stuff particularly because it moves, it, mm. it gets broken down, it gets burnt, wh- whatever, but uh, so no- nothing abnormal, but probably the abnormal side of it is realistically is it's a lot of the markers are so far away, especially on the mountain section. Yeah. And if you're not looking, it's just a tiny little dot in the distance. But if you're not looking at that, you're in a whole world of hell. And how will it change? Will it change now? Because they've done a lot of resurfacing. So is there any points on the road that you use as reference as well? Not particularly, no. Grades it's just something like, a, like, said, like a lamp post or there yeah. might be like a bollard or something on the mountain or something like that, blah, blah, blah. But there's it's a few places for looking from the Twitter on the, the Facebook. There's photos from like maybe, I think it's a Ren, not Ren Cullen, a Glen Tramon. But they've pulled a lot of trees down. And it looks make it normally it's quite dark in there, and it quite looks quite compact. Now mm. it looks like they pulled all the trees out. It's gonna be quite open and light and bright, you know. So it's, when we go back in a couple, of, or when I go back, I need to that's something that you got to look for, you know, when you go when you need, when you're doing your laps. So I remember 2019, for example, Crosby uh, through uh, the fast left uh, up to Crosby, the pub on the right hand side. There were like a 
you used to just be like we line with bushes in 2019 they were uh, like a construction site they were building houses and you're flying through there and you're thinking not where you are because obviously you know where you are but yeah. it's a bit oh that's a bit bizarre why, like, why is it so bright there kind of thing because because obviously they pulled all the trees down it made it open and uh, clear kind of thing so it was just that a bit off-putting at first but obviously your brain and you, you get used to it eventually yeah do, do you like those sections the fast flat out big jumps i'm talking crosby balakra you know the, those kind of areas or would you prefer to have two no, wheels on the ground two wheels on the ground me you know yeah. Yeah, yeah the big the big the jumps and stuff like that are a bit can be a bit off-putting you know but it's uh i, I tend to like keeping wheels on the floor and just uh the, i've kind of the technical stuff i kind of like a bit better you know or the mountain especially you know because it's similar to where i live you know the it's the mountain road up there over the uh, they call it cocker where we live it's it's very similar to the actual mountain course you know or the mountain road so it's uh I, I do like the mountain a lot so 2022 tt what your what are your expectations what you're hoping to to get out of it obviously you've you've broke that 130 mile an hour uh marker so obviously you want to you want to get faster no yeah, doubt, yeah but what what will you leave the island happy with like like i said before my, when i when i go to the tt every time i've gone back to the tt if i can go faster than was when i was last time i was there then I, i'm i'm doing a good job you know i'm going in the right direction so i always tend to just look at my lap times my pace from the races and blah 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 and if i've gone better than i was in 2019 then i, I, I go i go on mapper but it's going to be difficult obviously oh. this, this season because it's two years out you know it's it's a big it's going to be a bit of a eye open and a bit of a wake-up call for me i'll go back you know because it's, it's a long time not riding around the, the tt course you know and i think it's going to shock a few people i think i'm going to give you the real answer for that now go right on. so Especially on the Super Twin, he's going there and he wants to win that race 100% and he wants to tell, yeah, yeah, show yeah. all them factory boys you don't need fairy lights on your bikes to flipping win races. <laughs> no, he's right. I said, you, I want, you want to, obviously, the, the main aim when you go racing is to win a race, you know. Sure, yeah, yeah. But I always look at the TT in a different aspect because it's just, it's against the time, you know. So if you're going faster, you're going moving up the leaderboard. So if I can go faster than I was then last time, then I'm doing a good job. But here, here's the question though would you, would you rather go faster, 131, 132, but finish out of the top 10? Uh, or go 130 and finish in the if top you go, 10. If you're going, but if you are going faster, then you, you will be further up the, in, inside the top 10. So but everyone might go. Everyone else might yeah, go. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Or would you rather go 135 mile an hour in the senior? I'd rather do 135 mile an hour in the senior and win or, the thing. Or win, well, yeah, <laughs> or win the super twin. What would you rather do? Oh. Go faster on the go faster overall, or or take your first win. First win would be nice, obviously, but it's. Yeah, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult answer. You can't really answer it because obviously you want to go faster, but then you yeah. want to win. So it's a, a win would be lovely. You know, it's one of them things to to see you've done the TT. I, I've won around the TT course and in the, in the classic TT, but it's uh, to win an actual island, the actual TT would be a, a dream come true. If you won it, would you would you call it a day or would that motivate you to, probably, to carry on? I think it would motivate you more to carry on. I think <laughs> it sounds wrong, but yeah. it probably does. You know. Your missus probably didn't want to hear that. No, definitely not, no. <laughs> and Steve didn't want to hear it because he'll have to see my mum again for another few years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah. is, is everyone going to let you just win? Let him go. Yeah, let yeah. him go. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking earlier, he could have won at least 10 TTs, but when he's on his last lap, he just rolls off across the mountain. He's like, I don't want to get home just yet. I'm just going to run away. Keep going. Extra keep five going, minutes. Keep going. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've got 10 quick fire questions for you. Okay. Now you can only answer one or the other. Right. Okay. There's no explanation needed or wanted. Right. Okay. Lager or bitter? Lager. Pineapple or no pineapple on a pizza? No pineapple. Yorkshire or Isle of Man? Oh, that's difficult. West Yorkshire or Isle of Man? West Yorkshire. West Yorkshire. <laughs> Super sport or lightweight? Oh, <laughs> lightweight. Hutchie or Michael Dunlop? Uh, Dunlop. Slicks or treads? Treads. Mm. Balascari or Gorse Lee? Gorse Lee. TT Pillion Ride with McGuinness or Hickey? McGuinness. Mm. Best mate Stag do or your mother's 70th birthday bash? She must be, she must be 70. <laughs> Easy. Uh, uh, best mate Stag do. I was going to say 70th birthday because it probably would be a better party. Right, last one, number 10. Marrying the love of your life, Sophie, mother to your two kids, or a senior TT win? A senior TT win. Go oh, get in there, my son. News have just come That's in. That's a determined Jamie's, right? Jamie's now single. <laughs> We've got, we got a spare bedroom at your guys. <laughs> Jamie, it's been an absolute pleasure. We uh, we wish you all the success, and we'll obviously we'll see you out in, uh, in a couple of weeks yeah, on the thank TT. Thank you very much, boys. Hey, Thanks good luck, me. mate. Cheers, thank you very much.
Steve, he's, um, he's, he's still a little bit bitter about not taking that victory. Do you think he's got one in him this year? I really do, yeah. especially on the lightweight. You know, I mean, he's he is hundred percent. He's faster on the smaller bikes than the big bike at the moment. But um, yeah, he he he's proved, uh, you know, um, how fast he is on the lightweight. Um, I think he's going to be there. He's he's starting number one. He's proud of that. But pretty much, I think that's pretty much to get his head down and try and clear off. What's your predictions for for the big bike for him? Hey, that's a tough one to answer because obviously, you know, the boys have had three years off. They've missed two years at the TT. So, you know, there's going to be a few rusty people. Some say not. Hickey says not. Mm -hmm. He he thinks they'll be straight back on the pace. But for me, some of these guys are going to be just a little bit rusty here and there. And if, and hopefully, I'm touching wood here, that we get good weather all practice week, that will certainly help things. However, if the conditions aren't so great practice week, then some of those boys are going to be rusty going into the first race. So we'll have to wait and see. Oh, sitting on the fence. This has been episode 10 of the TT Podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then please hit that subscribe button and leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to these podcasts. We have plenty more star-studded names from the world of the TT on the way for you in this series, and here's a little taste of what you can expect from our next guest, your reigning senior TT champion, Dean Harrison people do try and put a bit of pressure on you but I, 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 I try and ignore it I just think what will be will be what I'm still going to try my best with the bike I've got mm-hmm. so whether I've got pressure on me or I don't if I'm still going to do my best what difference is it going to make so you just think yeah in last place you wanted pressure is the Isle of Man that next episode will be out in two weeks time and will be our final podcast before we go racing at the TT in 2022 Until then, don't forget you can get all the latest TT news and features over at iomttracers.com and be sure to check us out on all the usual socials. We are at TT Racers Official. Thanks for listening.